Are you ready? Mm -hmm. oh. Yes, I am. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Allow me to take this opportunity on behalf of the Transitional Justice Interest Group of the Environmental Peace Building Association to welcome you to this day's discussion, which will focus on an often overlooked aspect in transitional justice practice, which is environmental reparations. Thank you for taking the time to join us. By way of a brief introduction, the Environmental Peace Building Association is a global community of practitioners, academicians, students, decision makers, and others who are interested in the themes of environment, peace building, and conflict. It is started in 2012, but since then, we continue to share knowledge and emerging trends and research in this environment, conflict, and peace studies and thematic areas of discussion. You're welcome to join the community of practice and more so to participate in the upcoming third international conference on environmental peace building, which will take place in The Hague. Our president will be talking about it shortly. A link will also be shared in our chat that will give you more information. So the panelists for today will share insights from the United Nations Compensation Commission's approach to environmental reparations following Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. This discussion is meant to elicit, hopefully, provoke thought as well for practitioners today and could inform transitional justice today and also tomorrow. Our moderator for the session will be Loiva Judges. She will introduce our distinguished guests and lead us through the discussions. Throughout this discussion, the chat is open. Feel free to post your questions or comments as the discussion continues. After the discussions, we will have a question, comment, and answer section. The webinar is being recorded and will also be posted in our YouTube channel. Also to kindly remind us, kindly keep your microphones muted unless you are speaking. Lastly, I wish to inform you that this discussion is part of a series of a discussion in the area of environment and transitional justice. Our next discussion will be taking place in April and will be focusing on environment transitional justice in Colombia. And you're welcome to register with us. So at this point, allow me to welcome the president of the association, Carl Brook, to give us a few remarks. Welcome, Carl, and thank you for joining us. So much, Munini, and um, thank you all for joining. This is very exciting. I also am uh, delighted that uh, we are recording this because we find that a lot of the sessions are, um, we, we have a good discussion and then we also have a wonderful uh, number of people that watch the recordings. And this is, as Munini noted, part of an arc of new work that the Environmental Peace Building Association is undertaking. Um, a lot of it, <laughs> led by, inspired by Munini um, in, in the run-up to the second International Conference on Environmental Peace Building. Uh, Munini led a process that fed into the African Union's transitional justice policy, trying to bring out uh, further environmental dimensions. And uh, in the run-up to the third International Conference on Environmental Peace Building, which will be held in The Hague June 18 through 21, of this year. Um, the link is in the chat there. I encourage people to check it out. Uh, we have a lot of interests in accountability, uh, financial criminal, um, in uh, transitional justice, in justice in transitions, which I think is often broader than some people might interpret transitional justice or understand it. Um, I also do want to encourage people to check out that we have the agenda, uh, the draft agenda available on the web. Amazing. The agenda itself only, you know, just names, titles, countries, runs 21 pages. It's it's going to be an amazingly rich uh, group of people. And um, I'm seeing some, uh, some a lot of names that I've known for a long time, some that I haven't seen in a while. Steve, I'm looking at you. Um, but uh, it's, you know, the conference is uh, historically, it's an incredible blend of um, thinking and new thinking and um, 
uh, networking and mentorship. And so I encourage you to look at this. Um, and as Munini said, this is, uh, this is part of a series of discussions and uh, distillations of experience uh, that we have seen in how do you address the environmental injustices after conflict to lay the ground for a sustainable peace um, while promoting accountability at the same time. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'll turn it over to Loeva. Thank you, uh, Munini and Carl, for this uh, opening words. I'll now briefly introduce the two panelists uh, for today's session and uh, open the floor to them. Um, so first, uh, Simi Payne is an uh, associate professor at Rutgers uh, University in the US. Um, and there she teaches and uh, conducts research on issues related to international environmental law. Um, Simi Payne is, has worked extensively on uh, environmental reparations she served as legal counsel at the UN uh, Compensation Commission on Environmental Claims. Uh, during on the, on her experience, uh, she wrote a book um, called uh, Gulf War Reparations and the UN Compensation Commission uh, Environmental Liability in um, um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and she also wrote uh, several papers uh, on the UNCC and environmental reparations um, related to her work on, on environmental reparations. She also acted as an uh, expert uh, in the case Costa Rica versus Nicaragua before the International Court of Justice. Um, Lana Nath uh, is currently a managing director of, of the nonprofit organization Transparentum. In, he has an important background in environmental law and access to justice. He worked uh, in the capacity of legal advice legal um, officer uh, at the environmental claims unit of the un uh, compensation commission during his time uh, there he supported the processing of environmental claims he also worked in close collaboration with experts and um, in particular he went to uh, saudi arabia for a mission to assess the the damage caused um uh, on the Saudi desert from the first Gulf War. Um, so that that is it for for the brief uh, brief introduction. Um, I would like uh, to to start the session uh, with uh, the first question to Simi. Um, could you please explain for us what is the uh, United Nations Compensation Commission? In what context it was created, and uh, what was its mandate? Thank you. Well, um, first, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you, Carl, for creating the association. Thank you, Munini and Loeva for the uh, specialist group and your work in bringing together this series. I'll certainly be watching the uh, other webinars with great interest. Um, I should make a initial disclaimer that the views that I express here don't necessarily represent those of the institutions with which I'm affiliated. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce the UNCC as soon as I can figure out how to get the slides to work right. And you can see the slides okay? And you can hear me? Okay, good. Um, so the this whole process began with the invasion of Kuwait, which is a little tiny country, you can see I've sort of circled it in red here on the map, um, adjacent to Iraq. And Iraq invaded Kuwait in August of 1990. The international armed conflict was followed by Iraq's occupation of Kuwait. The UN Security Council quickly responded and declared Iraq's invasion a breach of the United Nations Charter prohibition on the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. Now, I'm going to lay out not just the bare bones, but I'm going to try to highlight some of the things that make this a different kind of conflict from some of the others that we're looking at today in the world, um, but without drawing those lines. But I'll give you some of the background there to connect these things. The, and the Security Council role is one of those key points. 
Uh, by January, Allied forces had started the assault to push Kuwait out of Iraq, uh, sorry, Iraq out of Kuwait. And Iraq, in response, began to blow up Kuwait's oil wells. This is actually some uh, other photographs to give you a sense. You can see the oil wells uh, in the background here, a uh, destroyed tank, so the uh, damage from military equipment abandoned, um, the road construction, you can get a sense of the disruption of the desert. You can see the oil well fires in the background and the dense black smoke that resulted from that. Here, um, there were fortifications in the desert that, so there was significant um, moving of de the soils and disruption. And remember that Although a desert doesn't look like a, a complex ecosystem to us, if we're not from that region, it is in fact a complex ecosystem, just as ecosystems elsewhere are. The uh, This is an aerial view showing the smoke plumes from some of the oil well fires, but you can also see, I think offshore, you're seeing some of the oil spills that were intentionally caused by Iraq in the uh, Gulf. February, um, Iraq withdraws. A couple of days later, a ceasefire takes effect. And in early April, the Security Council issues or adopts um, Resolution 687, which memorializes the terms of the ceasefire it settles a number of issues related to the conflict, including peacekeepers, humanitarian aid, border demarcation, applicable international humanitarian law treaties, and restitution of Kuwaiti property. And for our purposes, the incredibly important step of establishing the UN Compensation Commission as a form of reparations. Now, you'll also note if you're reading the slide that the damage specifically calls out environmental damage and the depletion of natural resources. So this was an exceptional step in international law. The words you're seeing there are absolutely a historic watershed moment that have created, they opened the door to being able to put environmental damage on the table as a subject for peace building, international conflict. Um, the institutional structure that was created is, a, so the UN Compensation Commission was a subsidiary organ of the Security Council. It operated within the framework of the Security Council resolutions. And it follows a legal process. Um, So, oh, I, one other point is that you need to have money if you're going to have a compensation fund. The source of the compensation fund here was a percentage of Iraq's oil revenues, which were subject to international controls administered by the United Nations. That's another almost unique point about the UNCC, that there was this fund available to actually pay uh, for reparations. Although we didn't know at the time, the price of oil went up over the course of these events. And so we didn't know at the time that there would be sufficient money to pay for all the environmental damage awards that were actually um, confirmed by the governing council. So the legal frame is the breach of the UN charter. That's the use ad bellum, the initi initiation of war, not the law of war during armed conflict, not international humanitarian law. Again, a difference from what you might see in other contexts. Um, this is the under international law. Iraq engaged its state responsibility, which requires reparations. The standard for reparation is that it must as far as possible, wipe out all the consequences of the illegal act and reestablish the situation which would in all probability have existed if that act had not been committed. That's the uh, comes from an old case called the factory at Horjouf. And so 
this is where the, the legal framework comes from. In addition to that, the UNCC had a governing council that issued the policy decisions and made the final decisions on awards. And these are the measures that it said would be some of the bases for environmental claims. So the um, abatement and prevention of damage, so response to the disasters, um, response, reasonable measures already taken to clean and restore the damage or future measures that might be taken. That's an important issue. Uh, a country that's just coming out of conflict might not have the financial resources to pay for restoration. And you know, it's great if you can show up in front of the court and say, look, this is what we paid. This is why we had to pay it. It's a little harder if you have to say, oh, in the future, we're gonna do this. Um, monitoring and an assessment of the damage was included as was the important element of monitoring of public health and medical screenings um, and depletion of or, or damage to natural resources. So the last oil well was capped about, well, less than a year after that. Um, and there's an extraordinary uh, IMAX video that was done to, uh, of the oil well fires that'll give you a sense of the scope of the damage. If you take a look at that, it's, um, something you can find on YouTube, and maybe someone can put that into the uh, chat, the link to that. This is a picture, an aerial view of what it looked like in trying to put some of those fires out. Um, ordinance was left in the desert. This is a, a slide that I think Lalanath may have taken the picture when he was um, on a field mission. Picture of the oil spill in the Gulf. Um, the UNCC, the summary for the environmental claims in particular, 168 claims reviewed in five different installments over six years and working at breakneck pace, I must say, and we usually for, uh, forewent our Christmas holidays, the, um, about $85 billion was claimed of that. Extraordinary, but over $5 billion was awarded and actually paid and used for environmental restoration. Um, so that, again, is this concrete result is one of the hallmarks of the UNCC. Um, this is some more pictures. These are Some of these are pictures that I took on mission in Saudi Arabia, the residual tar mats on the coast from the oil spill. Um, this was the team that was work of consultants, expert consultants working for the commission actually doing the damage assessment. Um, so on the left, you can see a salt marsh that was damaged by the oil spills. And a, a picture I took on the right of a healthy salt marsh. So that's what it should look like. Um, looking, digging down, looking for buried oil that's still having residual impacts. This picture is actually one of my favorite ones because this is a picture I took in Jordan on one of the restoration sites. It does not look beautiful, but it is revegetation of the desert in places that the desert suffered both depletion of aquifers and vegetation as a result of the refugees who passed through with their livestock. Um, I think I, I have a bit more... That, well, the, on the valuation of awards, I might as well uh, do this. So the, the valuation of awards included some different techniques. One was reimbursement where there had been expenditures. Another was the cost of the remediation, removal of contaminants. Another was restoration costs. So this kind of thing, the revegetation, reestablishment of aquifers, um, and then another technique that's used in uh, national systems called habitat equivalency analysis, which takes kind of an ecosystem services approach to look at the services and restore the services so that you don't have to try to put a number on how much is drinking water worth to us, which is extraordinarily difficult to do. Finally, I think a, another key point about the UNCC was that by agreement of all the parties, including uh, um, Iraq and the claimant states, that 
awards had to be used for environment. So there was a tracking program for both the during the course of our review and then a follow-up program to audit and do progress reports on funded projects. Um, something that we would very much like to see put in place in future compensation commissions. Um, so I think I'll end there and turn the floor back to my colleague who I uh, enjoyed working side by side with for quite a number of years. <laughs> so over to you, Lalana. Thank you, Simi. Um, let me start by apologizing to, um, to all of you for, for the fact that I'm actually sitting outside a concert hall. And so if you hear bits and pieces of Brahms' first symphony, it's simply because there's an orchestra rehearsing inside. I'm here because uh, thankfully, I happen to also wear another hat as a composer and one of my pieces are being rehearsed today. Uh, so apologies for that, but I'm, I'm very happy I'm able to join uh, Simi uh, and this uh, and present in this webinar. Um, thank you, Carl, uh, and thank you to all of our colleagues as well who've introduced us. Um, to to I just want to make two comments. I think the UNCC is uh, is a really important example. It's probably the only example of the international com community coming together to set up a compensation commission, uh, a reparations commission, uh, which included reparations for the environment. And in that context, I think it, it, it affords a really important precedent. Um, I wanna make two broad comments. The first is uh, about the replicability of the UNCC. Is it possible in future conflicts or current conflicts to use the UNCC and to replicate such a commission? Um, and I, I have my doubts as to whether it is possible simply because um, it raises the question of, of funding for compensation. Where will the funds for compensation come from? Uh, in the case of the UNCC, as uh, Simi said, the money came from uh, a percentage, I believe it was 30% or 25% of Iraqi oil sales was uh, you know, diverted. Uh, to towards this, and then later that sum was that that percentage was reduced over time. But there was a source of ready funding for uh, the uh, payment of compensation. Environmental claims just being one type of claim that was entertained by the UNCC. There were the personal loss claims and the business claims and so on and so forth, um, which all had to be paid out, running into billions of dollars. So one of the questions that you would have in a, in a conflict situation of establishing such a commission is, is the is there's a country at fault or the country that has violated the international law, does it have resources uh, to pay compensation? And uh, in most cases, you would find that they're probably, you know, through warring parties, maybe developing countries and neither has real resources to talk about. Um, or uh, you might find that if one of the countries is, uh, you know, wealthy and has the resources, it is very likely perhaps one of the permanent members of the of the UN, uh, which simply means that the veto will be used, and therefore it's unlikely that you will have a commission which can make uh, awards against that party. So these are obstacles, challenges that would have to be faced in trying to replicate it. That said, there could be very creative ways. For example, you may have conflicts in which uh, the assets of one of the parties or some of the assets of one of the parties might have been seized uh, through sanctions regimes. And you may be able to convert those uh, assets into funds, uh, which can, can be uh, fed into a compensation fund for the purpose of paying, you know, if not all, at least some of the reparations, including for the environment. So you can get creative around that, but I think it nevertheless poses a challenge. So that's a, the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make is about the procedures. One of the interesting things about the UN uh, Compensation Commission, and in particular the environmental claims, is that there was a great effort put in by the commissioners, by the staff, by the governing council and others to try and give Iraq, uh, who is in this case, 
the offending party an opportunity to defend their position, to defend the, the you know, uh, against the claims, to pre prepare a defense against the claims. And this did not happen at the very beginning. It uh, it certainly didn't happen in all of the other, in many of the other claims where Iraq was actually given a very limited opportunity to contest the claims. But in the environmental claims, gradually you see, as you, if you examine these claims, an evolution towards allowing Iraq to participate fully, to have counsel, to have access to the documents, to present a defense and so on, which I think is a very important due process development in the context of the environmental claims. However, there is a political background to that. And that is, if you analyze the actual evolution, you will see that it coincides, and I only say it coincides, it may not be cause and effect, although perhaps it, you know, one might argue that it was. It coincides with the second, uh, the, second uh, the invasion of Kuwait, basically, by uh, George Bush, you know, led by uh, the United States and uh, some other countries who joined the United States uh, in evicting um, the government, in throwing the government out of, of capturing Saddam Hussein and trying him and all of that, and basically the uh, Iraqi invasion. At that point, you see that Iraq is then begun to also uh, be afforded a higher uh, involvement in the in the claims process. So those the point I want to make here is that while we can certainly take the procedures that were put in place in the, in the environmental claims, as well as the methods that the commission followed in evaluating these claims and looking at the evidence in the way in which the claims are classified to begin with monitoring and assessment so you can gather the evidence, providing countries with funds to gather that evidence and analyze it and present it to the commission. And then at the end, you also have the restoration claims. You have the program, you know, which monitored, as Simi said, you know, tracked the restoration effort. So all of that methodology, I think, is very useful, not only, uh, well, you know, was usable not only to the commission, but could be very useful for a future commission looking at environmental claims. That said, uh, the flag I want to plant is that procedures are not neutral. Uh, and that sometimes procedures can be weighted in favor of one or the other of part of, of a disputing party. And so it may be worth, uh, you know, looking at the state of procedures as they were at the very end of the environmental claims as, as the better part of practice of the UNCC. Let me leave it at that. I'm, I think we can, you know, hopefully open this up for more questions or comments. If I may, um, something that has also been very much different, a very different approach that's been in the news. Um, there was a decision taken by the older George Bush, who was uh, president during the 1990-91 conflict, um, not to go into Iraq and not to try to bring criminal charges. It was discussed, you can see it in the New York Times, you know, that whether um, Saddam Hussein should be charged with war crimes. But there was a decision not to do that for various political and strategic reasons. Um, now we see a lot of discussion of the International Criminal Court and um, ecocide, environmental war crimes are very much in the headlines, really almost to the exclusion of talking about the more kind of civil law process that would um, result in maybe restor maybe restoration rather than accountability. The other aspect of that is that the relationship between a prosecutor and a judge is very different from the kind of adversarial approach that you might see in both in the civil system and as in civil versus criminal or civil versus common law in the common law system, you see the adversarial approach. And this is really pertinent to what Dr. De Silva just said um, with respect to how much process is afforded to the respondent who is the defeated belligerent and how much 
um, of a role does the judiciary take in the actual investigation? How much does it sort of push that off to the parties? So that that may be a little down in the legal weeds, but I think it's something that's important for us to think about because we have to make choices about which national or international fora, criminal or non-criminal fora. Um, and in transitional justice, this is a really new area to start thinking about because of the nature of environmental claims. Thank you, uh, Simi and Alana, uh, for, for those thoughts. Um, maybe uh, you could uh, elaborate a little bit more on um, whether there's been um, an environmental impact assessment uh, leading to the, to the UNCC and also how the UNCC approached um, the assessment of the damages and then the, the reparations. Um, I, I let you decide, yeah, who, who wants to, to start. Um, Simi, why don't you start? I can add on. Um, so we the UNCC followed what has a uh, pretty well established national practice that you look at environment what what is the baseline extremely hard to determine what the baseline was because you weren't necessarily measuring the aspects of the environment that are damaged before the conflict starts um so but you need to know that in order to say how much of the damage is caused by the conflict. You have to take into account if was this an industrialized area where there was already a lot of hazardous material on the ground, for instance. The belligerent who's the respondent shouldn't have to pay for that. They should only have to pay for what they, the harm they caused. So there's questions like that. Um, so part of it is what is the state of the environment now? What was the state before? How much is attributable to the conflict? In, at the UNCC, monitoring and assessment was included. There was a debate that you might remember long enough about whether these were claims preparation costs, which is usually like attorney fees and things like that, and aren't normally considered to be something that the respondent has to pay for. And that was decided that, no, that really is part of the cost of the conflict that one incurs when one commits a breach of international law. I, I can only add that uh, it was from, from, you know, from a purely a professional point of view, a very interesting period for all of us who were, you know, there were I guess there were 11 or 15 lawyers from around the world um, in the environmental claims unit. And um, for example, to determine whether certain tracks that you could see on a satellite, uh, you could see on the ground, uh, were caused by tanks, you know, rolling over the over the desert, or whether they were actually, as Iraq might uh, have argued, were caused by Bedouin, uh, you know, uh, taking their flock of uh, sheep and cattle, and, 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 and I'm sorry, livestock, um, including sheep. Uh, you know, uh, to pasture uh, from one place to another, that the tracks were created by by the Bedouin. You know, how do you make a dis how do you decide which it is? And at that time, I remember we were able to uh, locate satellite maps, uh, satellite images that had been taken before the conflict and after the conflict, and this enabled uh, experts to help determine which uh, the, the cause of the tracks. And in some cases, they were Bedouin, of course. In other cases, they were obviously military vehicles traveling over the tracks. So uh, the, I guess the point I want to make is that, you know, satellite imagery um, of forests, for example, you know, you, the Global Forest Watch, for example, has literally 24-hour image updates of the forests of the world. And you can literally see the trees because it is so fine now, the the the, uh, the the scale is so so small. They can literally see the canopy of a tree disappearing when it is logged. Um, so you, our state of it, state of evidence of the environment and the status of the environment is much better now than it was 
when the UNCC had to face that challenge. Um, we are also, I think, in a much better position today because of the environmental awareness. Many countries have done baseline assessments uh, of their environmental assets and uh, ecosystem services. Many have produced national action plans, whether it be for the climate or for the sea or the of the, of the seashore or for their forests. So there is a lot more data and evidence available now to determine baselines uh, in the case of a conflict. That said, the challenge that uh, that uh, Professor Payne uh, alluded to earlier still does remain. And you could have um, points of contention around whether something was actually caused by the conflict or not. Yes, uh, thank you. Um... In relation to the, the collection of uh, evidence, um, where what was there um, a risk um, so that uh, one of the party would dispute the the evidence, and um, in that case also what what was the evidentiary standard uh, that was used by by the UNCC? Um, maybe uh, to Lalana as well. I mean, I can start. I'm sure Simi has um, some views on this as well. I mean, that clearly, Iraq was disputing uh, many of the claims and the evidence and the conclusions, analysis and conclusions that were being made by the claimant countries. Um, they disputed all of that. They had their own experts uh, who, in some cases, requested access to those countries. I, I think they were not granted access in, in many cases, if not all cases. Uh, so they couldn't go to the countries uh, and inspect the, the sites, but they could, of course, uh, give an opinion on the evidence that was available to them and had been produced by the claimants. They did dispute many of the claims and the evidence. So there is no question that parties will dispute the evidence uh, if, when it is produced, as in many disputes. Um, what was really interesting, though, is that you had the claimants and their experts on one side, you had Iraq and their experts on the other side, and thankfully, the commission uh, could hire its own experts. So we had a neutral source of expertise, in addition to the expertise on that the parties were providing, to be able to help the commission to decide whether a piece of evidence you know, fell on one side or the other side of the line, how to interpret that evidence and how to draw conclusions and analyze it. And I think we were very, very fortunate to have our own independent consultants to help us to do that. Um, they, they helped the commissioners to write some of the reports. They helped them to um, you know, analyze the evidence. Uh, and in many cases, there were scientists from entomologists to ordinance experts, those who knew how to handle, you know, uh, arms which were all over the desert uh, and how to dispose of them. There were uh, experts on soil, on vegetation. We had all of those experts available to the commission uh, who were independent of the parties. So that was another very important um, um, evidentiary uh, matter. I'll leave it to Simi to answer the question around uh, the standards of the evidence. So thanks. I, I, I think um, the points that Lalanath just made are extremely important lessons for the future. So I just want to underscore that the importance of what he just described in working with the experts for the judges. Our commissioners, all three commissioners were very experienced environmental lawyers. We had the first president of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea was the chair of our um, panel. Despite that, they were supported and helped enormously by the expert process that Lalanas just described. And that is not commonly the case. It should be for environmental claims. Um, so just want to urge that. Um, as far as the evidentiary standard goes, there were two, uh, essentially two different standards. The initial claims for, called the humanitarian claims for individuals dealt with millions of claims, and it was a, a really vast process. Um, there was a modified evidentiary standard for that. 
for the environmental claims and any claim over a certain um, dollar value, there was an elevated standard of evidence, which was, um, I actually don't have the words on the top of my head, but it the um, one of our commissioners actually was a partner in a U.S. law firm, a litigation partner in a U.S. law firm, and he was very accustomed to the kind of standard of evidence that's required in U.S. courts, which is a higher standard than is generally the case in international courts. Um, it's more stringent in a sense, you know, there's more, it's more demanding. So it's a, it's a little hard that we could say probably go down into the weeds more on that, but hopefully that gives you a sense. And, and, and we should say that evidence is the, the lack of evidence, the failure to have sufficient evidence was the main reason for claims to fail. So. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I want to maybe uh, uh, this, like uh, we received some questions and uh, wanted to point out uh, something that was mentioned uh, a few times. Um, it's about um, whether the interest of the of the local community, the the people impacted um, by the damage. Uh, um, to what extent they were uh, taken into account in the reparation process, and um, what was it, um, for example, so um, in addition to the, the data collection that was uh, made uh, by the UNCC, what were was uh, the yeah, indigenous knowledge or materials also taken into account? We can yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm speaking from my recollection here, and uh, you know, uh, so, to me, do correct me if I'm wrong. But I think the the main parties to each of these claims were states, were governments represented by their governments, and council appointed by the states. So you had Iraq, you had you know Jordan and Iraq on the other side, or you would have Saudi Arabia and Iraq on the other side, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, there were also claims by certain international organizations. Um, and uh, in, in those claims, which were brought by governments or states, um, the, 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 some of them might have had uh, consultative processes where they consulted with their populations, affected communities, in order to formulate their claim. So their experts would have gone out and you know talked to them. Um, similarly, uh, when the commission's experts went out and visited various sites, they definitely did speak with uh, the Bedouin. They did speak with uh, uh, you know community leaders. Etc. Uh, in trying to assess, uh, you know, how much they might have suffered or uh, what kind of harm they saw in what had happened. Uh, how I mean, that said, I'm I don't think there was a concerted, established, procedural part of the process which allowed individuals to send in their comments or to comment on a draft. Uh, you know, a draft of the proceedings or anything like that, uh, uh, or a, a draft of the, uh, the the commission's findings or reports. I don't think there was a process like that, as you might have today, for example, when an environmental impact assessment is done, you might open it up for public comment or, you know, take it out to the community for them to look at it and comment and give feedback. I don't think there was a process like that. But I, uh, I don't know. Anecdotal evidence does suggest that some governments would have consulted with some, some communities, and certainly the UNCC experts and staff, when they, whenever they went out on site visits for these claims, uh, did have occasion to talk with communities. I can add maybe a couple of um, observations from the field. The field visits I was involved in were to Saudi Arabia, and there um, the coastal areas that were affected were uh, actually security zones, and so they weren't inhabited. Um, so we did. There weren't that many encounters, and the, the encounters were with military personnel. Um, 
And for the public health claims, one of the uh, bases for of evidence was what kind of exposure people had to the various contaminants in that might have been part of the air pollution resulting from the conflict. And there was an interesting gendered element there, which is that um, in places where women are essentially sequestered in the domestic environment and women aren't in the workplace and it's not permissible for men to interview women in a domestic environment, men, unrelated men to interview women in a domestic environment, it became impossible to conduct a survey of households, household exposure. Um, so there are these kind of fine grain issues that you would run into different things in different contexts. Thank you. Um, so in relation to this, um, were the, the reparations um, granted uh, to the, yeah, what, to whom were the reparation granted? Uh, did they benefit um, the environment? Did they benefit the, the communities there, the states? Yeah, in this case, so uh, as Lalana has described, the environmental cl claims that we're talking about were brought by governments, and that was partly structured by the UNCC itself, the ca claims categories. So this kind of environmental damage was for um, sort of a, a you know common environment. There are questions there about there are, because the property structure for uh, land is different in these countries than it might be in Europe or other parts of the world. Um, there might be questions that would arise um, about what can the government take that trustee role for. Maybe it's fine as a general matter, but we haven't had a lot of experience. We do have now the experience of the Costa Rica versus Nicaragua case that you mentioned, Loeva, um, at the beginning. Um, but there again, it was government owned land. It was a uh, Ramsar wetland of international significance that was damaged. So you didn't have that question about, well, what if it's private property? There was in, in another category of UNCC claims, claims by individuals, uh, there was something that was described as a garden that was damaged. And there it was the owner who made the claim, whether the garden was actually what we would consider to be similar to the environment that was harmed in the government claims. I don't, I, there isn't enough detail in the uh, material available to us uh, to know. All right, yeah. Um, would you would you have any examples maybe of uh, how the reparations were implemented um, in, in practice? Well, one would be the photographs that I showed in Jordan where so the process would be Jordan said, came to the UNCC and said, as a result of the armed conflict, um, a number of large number of refugees came over the border. Jordan actually opened its border to refugees. And so it had an enormous number to take care of. They brought livestock. They depleted the aquifers. They destroyed the vegetation. Um, and so we need to restore that. How do you restore that? Then they would explain what they wanted to do to restore it. The panel's experts would review that and say, well, yeah, this is a standard best practice. Makes sense. They have the evidence to show what it was before, what it is after. Um, and, or, or they would say, well, you know, this is not the kind of damage in that case. It went on to an award, but in another case, they might say it's not actually the kind of damage that would be caused by what they're saying Iraq did, and then the claim might fail, um, or you really can't restore this 
and there isn't a technique that's reasonable to do it with. In the Jordan case, this particular refugee case that I had the pictures for, uh, the, there are techniques to restore aquifers and to replant vegetation. And so the cost of doing that work would be the value of the claim. That money was awarded. Jordan had to report back to the commission that, yes, we're spending the money on these processes. We set up greenhouses. We're out there planting. We did the uh, landscaping that we need to do to get the water to start going into the groundwater when it rains, that kind of thing. Is that responsive? Okay. Yes. Yes, it is very, very relevant. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe now we can um, move to discuss um, what, what maybe what which factors of the UNCC's approach uh, could be yeah maybe replicated or used in um, future uh, transitional justice processes. Um, maybe uh, Lanaf can start. Well, I think you know as I said at the beginning. Um... Uh, these methods of, um, you know, uh, the resource, resource economics methods, such as habitat equivalence. So if you lose, um, in one of Saudi Arabia's claims, it said it had lost ecosystem services, uh, let's say along the, along the seashore or maybe in a part of the, uh, uh, of a, of a seascape. Um, and, it was not possible to restore it because it had been so badly damaged. And so it is then you know, notionally at least possible to say, let us see if we can look, identify the ecos ecosystem services that have been lost here and see if we can create those or strengthen those in a different location, which would be equivalent to what you have lost. So maybe you can create a national park or a sea park somewhere else and then ensure that uh, those species are replicated or those species might be already there and you can protect them. So that's kind of the methodology of actually calculating the loss and of ensuring that there is enough funding to restore the environment or to compensate for that loss. Those are methods, I think, that are all uh, spelled out very clearly in the, in the, in the several reports uh, that were made, you know, that are available publicly. Uh, so that's one thing that I think would be a hugely useful um, uh, lessons learned, if you like, uh, you know, replicable material. The other, of course, is the process and the procedures that were followed, particularly in the last set of claims uh, for restoration and also for for loss and damage, um, which the which the UNCC's uh, you know the the environmental claims. Uh, the commissioners followed. Uh, you know, for the most part, they were being very innovative. They were inventing this procedure as they went along. You're muted, Lana. Sorry, you have the claims coming in. You have the staff looking at the claims, asking questions, sending out interrogatories or questionnaires to the governments that submitted the claims, getting more information in in hiring of the consultants, you know, and getting uh, independent consultants to look at it, go on site visits, you know, gather their own evidence. Then Iraq gets to see all of that and respond and defend the claims. You hear that side of the story. Uh, and in fact, in the, in, in the case of the environmental claims, unusually, I think, uh, there were actually hearings where council would get up and make submissions to the three commissioners. That was also very interesting. Uh, these were very innovative uh, procedures that were followed, uh, and in many cases, you know, were akin to what might happen in an international tribunal or court. And I think those procedures uh, could be also definitely replicable, and and our lessons learned, uh, and can be very useful to replicate. So those are two things I can I can straight away identify. Uh, the other things that might be replicated are the way in which the the, the claims are classified starting with monitoring and assessment to allow parties to go out and collect the evidence. Then you have the claims for restoration. Then you have the claims for, you know, uh, the the damage, loss and damage kind of claims. 
uh, you know, and, and the sequencing of those claims. Those are all things I think that would be very replicable and very useful for a future commission. Yeah, I think some lessons can be drawn from which claims succeeded and which failed for um, parties that the really paying serious attention to evidence of the quantity and the nature of the damage, but the quantification of the damage is essential to be able to provide a remedy. And so if one reads the reports of the commissioners closely, it, it's very visible that um, the, this evidentiary standard is important. I think one of the things that we didn't have that I would be very interested in, and that has happened in other transitional justice contexts, like the uh, South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, there's been a lot of study of those commissions and the public reaction to them, whether they actually perform the role that we want transitional justice to perform. Of course, restoring the environment is, a, for me personally, it's a primary goal of this. It's something that goes to restoring people's ability to live a healthy life and their psychological and cultural at ease with the place they're living. Um, but we haven't had the follow-up studies to find out what people in the countries involved thought about it, what's been their experience. Um, and so that would be extraordinarily helpful in understanding both the process, the relative transparency or opacity of the process. Um, for instance, the panel's expert reports were not allowed to be published. And despite the fact that everybody involved kind of wanted them to be, but there were internal UN rules um, about that. So is that problematic? How important is that to future processes? There's a lot of questions like that that I think could be asked and hopefully answered. Yeah, let me let me add on the question of opacity. I think uh, there's a lot of materials that were submitted with the claims, the evidence uh, submitted by the claimants, the the opposition from Iraq and their arguments. Uh, much of that is still embargoed and not released to the public. I don't know whether the 15 or 25 year rule or whatever that applies in the UN might end up uh, facilitating the release of that material or whether not. But that is unfortunate, particularly for the environmental claims. Uh, these are not claims about personal individuals, uh, you know, or loss individual losses. Uh, it doesn't involve, you know, uh, personal data and so on, they are, they are really uh, environmental information. And in my view, uh, and this is my personal view, it doesn't reflect any of the institutions I represent, uh, it should be released to the public and made, made available so that we can all look at it and learn lessons from it. I think that keeping it under lock and key is really doing a disfavor to, to humanity generally and to the environment. Thank you, uh, Simi and Anana, for, for um, highlighting those elements that uh, we could learn from um, the UNCC. I want to ask you if you have any uh, final comment to make uh, before we close the session. I don't, but I accept to say thank you for you know having us and also giving us the opportunity to talk about some of our experiences and um i hope it was useful yeah thank you so much for this it was uh interesting and we look forward to the next in the series okay thank you very much uh for all your thoughts um and yeah i want, I want to um thank you also um and thanks thank the audience uh for all the questions we yeah we uh I used those questions uh, uh, also during during the session. Um, 
And yes, I would like to thank also everyone who helped uh, making this uh, webinar happen. Um, I want to remind uh, that uh, the recording of the webinar will be uh, posted on the YouTube channel uh, shortly, and uh, that um, this is the first uh, webinar of the webinar series on transitional justice. And uh, the upcoming uh, webinar will take place on um, the 9th of April to discuss the, the transitional justice process in Colombia. Uh, so that is it. Uh, we finish on time. Um, yes. And uh, I wish you a good day. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you.